guys, and welcome back to another episode of Federico Talks Watches. Today, I want to talk about a subject that stops a lot of collectors, especially, you know, experienced collectors, from buying watches. And that is the cost of service. Is buying a certain watch, you know, make the cost of, you know, is the cost of service of buying certain watches prohibitive? Should you not buy it? because of the cost of service and this is something that even I fought with a lot in the past but now since I kind of run a service department through my business Delray Watch Supply and we service everything from a simple ETA 2824s to uh, we got a perpetual calendar the other day we haven't had a tourbillon yet but we are capable um, I'm more familiar with service pricing and it's actually a lot simpler and a lot more reasonable than one might think. And that is what I want to talk to you guys uh, about today. Also, if you guys love Speedmasters, please go take a look at DelrayWatch.com, my website where I buy, sell, and repair pre-owned watches. We just got a ton of new speedies in. Speedy Professional, Speedmaster Mark 40 Black Dial, Speedy Reduced, and also, my personal favorite, a super rare white dial tritium loom Speedmaster Racing Edition, mainly sold in Japan. So if you guys are big Speedy fans, go take a look at DelrayWatch.com. Oh, and also, that Grand Seiko I mentioned the other day, we have it on sale as well. Check out the hot deal section. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for supporting me, but let's get right into the meat and potatoes of this conversation. Servicing. Is it cheap? Absolutely not. Uh, skilled watchmakers are getting harder and harder to find, especially watchmakers that can work on more than just ETA. Now, I'm lucky to have a pretty awesome watchmaker, Hansi, on staff, and I wish I could be making this video with him today, but we're just so backed up that uh, he hasn't had a chance, And but I do promise we will get him on camera again uh, relatively soon. But yeah, service isn't cheap, but it's also not as expensive as you may think. While Rolex might charge you $800 to service your Submariner, Patek might charge you, I don't know, I'm guessing about $1,100 to service your time-only Calatrava. Uh, I don't know, IWC might charge you $700 bucks to service your Valjoux 7750 base chronograph. Those are all, you know, rough estimates of what the manufacturers charge. However, independent watchmakers work a little bit differently. Now, caveat, I'm only talking about the prices we charge here at Delray Watch Supply, right? So I don't know how other independent watchmakers do it, but Hansi kind of walked me through it, and he made me understand that most services fall into one of four categories, at least for him. A lot of independents do it similarly, a lot of them do it differently, um, but at least for Hansi, who's extremely experienced, you know, four categories. And those all differ in prices. And I'm going to explain them today so you can kind of judge what it's like to earn certain, uh, to own certain watches. Another little caveat, not all independent watchmakers are created equal. If you don't know your independent watchmaker well, if you don't trust them, please send your watch to the manufacturer. Because you're surprised, you would be surprised, how many watch butchers really exist out there. Anyway, as I said, four categories of service, and they're all split up into different uh, price points. So category one, $350 for service. Category two, $450 for service. Category three, $650 for service. Category four is on a case-by-case -case basis. That's how we do it here at Delray. So what falls into these categories? How does this work? Well, category one is the most basic of Swiss movements. So the Unitas 6497 or its variants, ETA 2024 or its variants, uh, a Peso movement. All those watches are 350 to service, fairly straightforward. And also another thing I realized is even though and this doesn't apply for all watchmakers, but even though uh, an excellent watchmaker may not have worked on a movement, all the architecture um, are, are fairly similar. So if you have a very experienced watchmaker, you know, you should easily be able to kind of figure out 
uh, how complicated this movement is and how much he, you know, and he'll know how much to charge you, even if he hasn't necessarily worked on it. Now, of course, Turbion's perpetual calendars, those are a special case. But um, if you have a watchmaker that's never maybe worked on a Pesso, which is very, very strange, if he worked on a 6497, a Pesso is very, very similar. So movements are all kind of related one way or another, even if they're not ETA based. But yeah, category one, 350, the basic Swiss movements. Category two, 450. These are the more, a higher, these are the higher end time only movements with one caveat. So ETA 2892, uh, Rolex, any Rolex including the day date, uh, apart from the Daytona obviously. Uh, a Patek Calatrava, Vacheron Constantine, AP, Jaeger. Any time only high end movement starting from 2892 is 450 uh, and up. At least that's how we do it. And there is one caveat, which is the simplest chronograph, only the only chronograph at this price point, the Valju 7750. Hans can do that with two hands behind his back and a toothpick in his left foot. You know, it's he he knows the 7750 like the back of his hand. He also used to work for Breitling. So that falls into that category. Category three, 650. This is chronograph and simpler uh, non-grand complications. So this is everything from a 2892 with a Dupuis de Pra chronograph module. We've got a, uh, a Jaeger Master Chrono, a Rolex Daytona, a Speedy Pro, uh, an AP Royal Oak. Basically, all chronographs, including the Valju 7751, which has nine hands. That's the triple date. And most other complications fit in here as well. So if you have like a triple date calendar, or if you have a world time, um, stuff like that is in the 650 range. And as you can see, it's fairly broad. Just because you bring in a 2892 or a Rolex, the service price is the same. Just because you bring in a Daytona or a Royal Oak Chrono. Once again, the service price is the same because the architecture is not that different. Chronograph is a chronograph. Uh, the basic functioning is the same. Sure, some has better, some have better finishing, some have column wheels, but they pretty much do the same thing. Uh, there is a caveat here as well. Obviously, the super exotic stuff is in category four. An example of this is a Longue datagraph. Now, while it's just a chronograph, it's the most complicated chronograph in the world, um, at least simple, non, you know, split second. So that would be in category four. And category four is the case by case stuff. So uh, perpetuals, turbions, super complicated uh, chronographs, uh, split second chronographs, minute repeaters, stuff like that. But, you know, a lot of people say Federico. You know, I saw this beautiful vintage AP, time only, but is it going to be hard to service in the future? Is service going to cost so much? The watch is only $3,000, but, you know, will service kill me? No, it won't. It's four fifty, dollars The same price as an ETA 2892, same price as a Patek Calatrava, same price as a Rolex. You know why? Because the architecture is fairly simple. At least, that's the way Hansi does it. Now, of course, there are a few more caveats in here, like parts are extra. If you need to service that IP, it might be 450 but if it needs a new mainspring, it might be 40 bucks on top of that to order a mainspring. So, this is all service uh, without the price of parts. And you'd be surprised, parts are very rarely needed to be ordered. But I guess the point of this video is not so much serve as an advertisement for our service department, but it's the fact that service prices don't really vary that wildly until you get into these super exotic complications. It's all, you know, it's either very, very simple autos, you know, normal autos, or chronographs and simple complications. Basically three categories. And most watchmakers, even if they charge very differently for a Rolex or 2892, they shouldn't because the job basically takes the same amount of time. But this goes to show you guys, I wanted to share this with you because don't be scared of buying certain watches because, you know, parts, uh, because service might be prohibitively expensive. Generally, it's not. 
One problem you may fall into is, are parts available? Guess what? I've never, 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 ever run into a issue where we're servicing a watch where we can't find a part. A part might take six weeks to be ordered. Or one time on a watch from 1905, Hansi had to hand make a part for it. That brought up the price a little bit. But every watch can always be fixed. Always. The worst case scenario is fabricating a new part to replace the broken one. But I just wanted to demystify watch servicing a little bit because it's a topic that very few people, including myself until quite recently, knew a whole lot about. And the truth is, uh, you know, while, while servicing a watch may not be simple, the whole pricing system um, is generally simpler than you think. And a lot of these manufacturers and some scummy independent watchmakers also prey on the ignorance and lack of knowledge that goes around uh, about watch servicing. But I just wanted to go to show, if, if my guy Hansi, with you know 35 years experience, has devised this simple pricing structure, I mean, and he says most watchmakers think of it the same. They don't care if you're bringing a Patek uh, time-only Calatrava or a 2892. Guess what? The Patek might be prettier. They both do the same thing with a very similar amount of parts and you know the job one job is not harder than the other once again all of this has caveats uh there are a few exceptions here or there i'm trying to generalize it to keep it simple but anyway guys did you find this useful i mean what do you think did this help you kind of figure out watch servicing at all i'd like to know please drop me a comment in the comment section below and also please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it it really helps me out, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any content. Anyway, guys, thank you for sticking around with, uh, with me for another episode of Federico Talks Watches, and we'll catch you in the next one. Take care.